The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right. You should have picked up a doctrine, the doctrine of the Abrahamic Covenant. God has provided for us a rapid recovery system from carnality, that is, being out of fellowship. It's called the rebound technique at Maranatha Church, and it only involves you confessing sins, known, unknown, uh, one confession, and even things you've forgotten, the deck is cleared. They may not last very long, sometimes it doesn't, but the fact is you have to make it an effort to, and a desire to find yourself filled with God the Holy Spirit for which we have a direct command and we now know what the mechanics are, what, what you have to do. Anytime, any place, you name it, you're forgiven instantly. Grace abounds for the believer in time. God has set up this system so that we can be ruled by the Holy Spirit who has taken up residency in each of us. Each of us are constituted a temple of God and we are not to just continually defile the temple by sinning and not acknowledging this, getting your mental attitude straight. Part of teaching here at Maranatha Church that, uh, that sets certain type of people off, they can't handle authority. God speaks through prophets, apostles, and he didn't put them down here without backing and without authority. Just as people in the world are appointed to positions of authority, they, uh, they are the authority. Whether it's uh, over an or organization, uh, in uh, the establishment chain of command, from the police officer, up the ladder, all the way. Authority is, is rejected by negative volition, and that's how this is to be communicated. It's straightforward. I have the authority to be up here this evening and to communicate to you the doctrine before you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end are the, way, the ways of death. We have chosen the way of life and abundant life through Jesus Christ and through the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. Thank you for this opportunity and everything seen and unseen that makes it possible for us to assemble this evening. In Christ's name, amen. All right, uh, well, as far as turning to the scripture, Turn to Genesis 12. All right, definition. We're talking about a covenant. Party of the first part, the initiator, God. Party of the second part, Abraham and his descendants. The Abrahamic covenant is a compilation of the promises of God to Abraham from his call out of Ur of the Chaldees, southern Iraq today, for you, at age 70. Remember, back then, longevity was greatly increased. It tapered off after the flood, but he's in that bracket. He, he made it to 100, he made it to 100, uh, what was that? Uh, 175, I think. Don't quote me on that. Uh, this, uh, we have the date as 1870, uh, 1876 B.C. That would make him born in 1846 B.C. Okay? He's 70. He's a young man. He's not like a 70-year-old today, typically. <clears throat> Genesis 12, 1 through 3, to the occasion of the sacrifice of Isaac 50 years later at 1826 B.C. But first, Genesis 12, we'll read the verses here 
the call of Abraham. Now, Abraham is a positive believer. Do married, no children. That's the big deal. Uh, no, no, no offspring. He's married. Uh, he lives in Ur. Uh, his father is T E R A H, Terah, and uh, had two brothers. One died early. The other lived on, uh, but uh, Abraham was the brother. They're all believers. Get this. They're all believers. All the, all the men in the line of Christ are believers. The good believers and the not good believers. And uh, so <clears throat> Genesis 12, 1. Uh, this uh, chapter uh, gives the covenant or the, the, the introduction of things to him uh, in a section dealing with the descendants of Shem and it goes all the way down. Uh, it comes down uh, uh, to uh, Terah in the previous chapter. Uh, but this gets, this, gets, this gets ahead of what's in chapter 12. You gotta be careful. Uh, Terah took Lot, his, uh, Abraham his son, and Lot is the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son's Abram's wife, and they went together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan, and they went as far as Haran and settled there. There has to be some clarification here. The, the reason they relocated is that Abraham got the call, and it sounds like Terah is the one masterminding all this, when, when in fact, it was Abraham who made this clear to his father, and his father went with him rather than stay back in Ur, and the family uh, went up to a town in, in, uh, up north uh, called Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. He actually died in Haran five years after they arrived there. Just data. Now the Lord had said to Abram, this kind of, this just jumps back. Go forth from your country. You're gonna be a man without a country. Go forth from it. And from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will show you a different land. And I will make you a great nation. Now this, none of this happens boom, boom. This is a long, drawn out process. But I'm gonna do this with you. I'm gonna make a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. Whatever fame you could have had down in Heron uh, is nothing compared to what I'm gonna make you great. I'm gonna get, make you a great name. They'll be known far and wide through time, all the way. And so you shall be a blessing. And uh, this is especially pertinent today with what's going on in Israel. And I will bless those who bless you. That's not just Abraham. It's those that descend from him. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, this is the messianic promise. This is the promise of the Messiah because the, the Messiah obviously was Jewish. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wherever there is positive volition and believers that have come on board, they will be blessed by association. So he, he starts this process. And uh, this covenant, uh, uh, there's more to it than this. We haven't got to the other parts of it. Uh, to the occasion of the sacrifice of Isaac 50 years later in Genesis 22. One of the biggest applications this man made. Isaac, the son of promise, the miracle baby, the miracle boy, who Sarah bore in her old age after God reconstituted them in their physiology so they could have a child and made them like young people. 
Let them get clear up there where they were both sexually dead. She was 99, he was 100. It looked, and it was, humanly, completely hopeless. None of this makes any sense if he has, doesn't have an error. And this is one of the dramas of the Bible. The miracle baby. The pregnancy of Sarah in her old age. And all those years, see, they had the promise. God doesn't put something out there. He doesn't back up. It looked, on the human realm, it looked hopeless. Sarah grew up around, they had an entourage when they went to Canaan. Abraham got a bunch of people with him, uh, cattle herders and men who were trained uh, to do combat if necessary because it was a wild, wild west. And so Sarah would see all these other women bringing them and showing them their little babies and the pressure built on her soul. And they made some mistakes, but nothing, nothing that negated anything. God expects us to wait on him, put our complete, total trust in him under all circumstances that we may face. It'll work out fine. A lot of applications off of this. A covenant is a contract between two parties. It requires point B, agreement between party of the first part, which is God, and party of the second part, which is in this instance, is Abraham. <clears throat> same covenant, same thing with the Mosaic covenant. It wasn't forced on the Jews at the base of Sinai. Volition, free will. Do you want to do this? You want to go for this? You follow my covenant, my rules, and I'll make you the greatest nation on earth, and I'll do all this for you, and I'll deal with your enemies right and left. All that the Lord says we will do in a unison voice of all the people at the base of Sinai. We'll do it. The marriage is tied. It's a marriage. And their decision affects all the Jews down the road the next generation and the next generation. What they did sealed the deal between God and Israel called the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant illustrates this as per God's part. Uh, Exodus 9. This is a, this is a, for those of you who weren't here, and those of you uh, they were. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, I got here the wrong one. Sorry. I got the wrong place here. I do that. My fault. Okay, Exodus 19, as you were. Uh, this is the one where I just cited, where they, on their, on their itinerary, it's, it's, all, it's all brought out here very clear. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from her freedom, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. This is in Saudi Arabia, by the way. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. That's a, that's a fake. They didn't cross the Red Sea. But I'm not going to go over that. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You are eyewitnesses. I took care of your enemies. They, don't, they, won't, they won't bother you for a long time. You saw what I did to them. Because the Egyptians cursed the Jews under the Pharaoh's uh, rule. 
and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. This is, a, this is a poetic language for I brought you something that would be impossible with men. I brought all the, a couple million people up out of Egypt with our animals, with our wagons. And I brought you up out of there. <clears throat> now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. This is still true. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're going to be a witness to all these Gentiles out here that are in darkness. You're the priest nation. You're the light nation. You're the nation that has the answers. <clears throat> These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They signed on the dotted line. They committed themselves. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. <laughs> he must have been in good shape climbing up and down that mountain. Wow. Uh, anyway, once the, the contract is agreed upon, execution depends on the integrity of the parties involved. The promises made to Abraham were accompanied by conditions, and therefore God was making, was making an offer in Genesis 12, 3. The promises made to Abraham were based on what God knew to be true about him, namely, that he would be obedient to his call and all other stipulations imposed on him during his lifetime. Genesis 18, 9. For I have known him. Genesis 18, 18, 19. In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. You did what I told you to do. Genesis 26, 4 and 5. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and I'll give your descendants these lands and by or through your, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Nehemiah 9, 7 and 8. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from the earth of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. He did, a, he did an upgrade on his name. Av means father, father of nations, Abraham. <clears throat> you found his heart faithful before you. You made a covenant with him to give the land of Canaan of the Hittite, the occupiers of the land at the time of Abraham when he entered up until the Joshua conquest. The Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give to his descendants. You, you, you have performed your words, for you are righteous. You kept all, all of this. The dispossessed people that were kicked out of the land and defeated by the conquest of the Jews, they deserved it. They were so very corrupt. Nations, like individuals, forfeit their rights if, they're, if, they're, if they are extremely corrupt. That's why there's the rise and fall of nations. That's why nations have become extinct. And there's some on earth today that probably are going to become extinct. This country is one of them. In one hour, a one day. Because we will not listen to that which is righteous as a, a, on the whole. The conditional aspect with, the Abraham, with Abraham includes his willingness to do the following. Separate from his homeland. Some people wouldn't do that. They were called to. His relatives. They wouldn't do that either. And relocate to an unknown land. Living there as a resident alien. Genesis 12, 1. Again, he said to him, Go forth from your country, your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. 
Hebrews 11, 8 and 9. Abraham, of course, is in the Hall of Fame uh, of believers in this list. By faith, just faith, taking God at his word. That's what, we're doing. That's what we do around here all the time. We take God at his word. We study it carefully, and we take him at his word, and we hang on to it. By faith, faith here in the active sense, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. That adds another wrinkle to it. It's one thing to know where you're going. So the decision was made by him and uh, the rest. We'll just uh, start leaving. We'll stop. If you look at the map, you can see where we're not going to go over to Persia. We're not going east. Uh, we're not going. We're not going. Uh, uh, we're, we'll just go north. We'll go up the river and cross it and go on up. And, uh, okay, there's the town of Heron. We'll go, into, we'll go into the town of Heron, set up shop, and uh, wait. And uh, God checked out Tira. He, he went into phase three. Uh and so a decision was made because you're trusting God. I got four directions I can go. I'm not going to go back south. That's out of the question. It's where it came from. So scratch that off. Let's go west. Let's head due west. And he did. And... Uh, uh, Um, more, more on this. Uh, the promise, the, the initial, the initial offering of the covenant has different has has different features of it. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Anybody can relate. Well, if you have a nation, you got to have real estate. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, I'll protect you, and, and 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 it's going to be in you. That means in your genetics all the nations of the earth is going to be blessed because down that long line, eventually, one Jesus was born. So Abraham went forth as the Lord has spoken to him in Genesis 12, 4, and Lot went with him. If we had music to this, we'd have to change the music right now. This is his nephew. See, he had a brother that died. Lot was the son of that brother. Abraham took him under wing acted as a father figure to him. One could argue, well, you didn't separate from everybody. Okay. He didn't do everything 100% perfect, but, but I can't fault him for having compassion over this young fellow. He would eventually separate from Lot. The separation didn't have to involve everybody all at once. In the case of Lot, when he had his little sojourn in Egypt and he came up out of there, it was time to separate from Lot. And he made Lot an offer. He didn't treat him nasty. And Lot had de dealt bad with him, I think. And Lot wasn't positive, but he was a believer. The New Testament says he was a believer. But his God and his love was money. Legitimate money. Legal money. <laughs> when a criminal... And that was his priority. That wasn't Abraham's. And Abraham ended up his life very wealthy. But he still was living in tents, a nomadic existence in the land of Canaan as uh, her uh, made his living uh, with cattle. Grazing on open range. Canaan and that whole area was sparsely populated. And then had the big bad cities that they later had and everything. And so Abraham comes in there as a total stranger. Well, he got his name in lights before he was out of there. He was a household name. Not because he went out and it's because he defeated the kings of the east. 
that came in there and raided Sodom and Gomorrah and held all, took all these captives. And he went in there for one reason, to rescue the dummy Lot. And he caught him at night. Him and his 300 was 18 men. They went at this big, massive army. And these names are in the Bible. And these are, these are people that we know from history. The kings, of the, the, the kings of the East. There's a list of them. And he hit their organization when they were relaxed and at night and made a hell of a bunch, a lot of noise. And it, it's called psychological warfare. They panicked. They grabbed their stuff and they ran off and left all the captives and all the wealth, all the booty that they pulled out of Sodom and Gomorrah right there on the ground. All Canaan heard that news. He got his name in lights. So in his own day, his name was great. But it just gets better and better as history goes on. You get to sit down with him, possibly, in the millennium. Many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have fellowship. That ought to be fun. But you, here you, you learn about it. Uh, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated. He was a businessman and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. Acquired? Yeah. They bought slaves. They acquired. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land. Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the Oaks of Morah. Now the Canaanite was in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham. Five years he hadn't heard a peep from God. That, would that wear on you? Not Abraham. He's just waiting. So when he, when he, when he, when he got to this location in the land, he, God spoke to him again. To your descendants, I'll give this land. Of course, he doesn't have one descendant yet, right? That's always there. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. <clears throat> uh, he proceeded from there to the mountain to the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, a big Canaanite city. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. That's, that, that was their worship service an altar where they offered a, a sacrifice signifying the coming Messiah. Abraham journeyed on, continued towards the Negev. That's south. That's way south of his, in Israel. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. He gets under his sin nature. The famine was so severe. He's raising cattle. Pressure is put upon him. Now him and his wife had an agreement. It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, see, this is, this, is, this is being under the fear factor. This is being out of fellowship. This is all done out of fellowship. See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman. You know, you're an exceptionally beautiful woman. And being vulnerable in this, what kings did, what he feared is some one of them would see him and kill him and take her as his wife. That was known to be done by kings. Not all of them, but some. So where's faith rest here? Where's your faith rest? He's under his sin nature. And with, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife and they'll kill me, but they will let you live. Now, he, he doesn't come across very good here, does he? Please say that you are my sister. So it may go well with me because of you, and I may live on account of you. You say, well, what did Sarah think of that? Later on in Genesis, she agreed to it. She wasn't, how dare you, you coward, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no. She agreed to it. 
And so the test went on. He comes to Egypt. The Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh had individuals out there looking for pretty women to add to the Pharaoh's harem. They said, hey, we found a real looker. They just came down to Egypt. They praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Oops. This looks like the whole thing is in jeopardy now, doesn't it? Whenever something happens and threatens God's plan, as it were, God steps in with something you didn't expect. Therefore, he treated Abram well for her sake and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female camel donkeys. He's given him all this. Pharaoh's got deep pockets. He gives him all this stuff because he's so happy to have her in his harem. But the Lord, oh, he's going to step in, huh? We're going we're gonna to break this whole thing up. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. All of the palace, everybody was sick. I mean, when you're sick as a dog and you're hurting real bad, you're not thinking about the opposite sex. <laughs> you can forget that. And it's noteworthy that not just a few people got sick. All, all through his organization, everybody suddenly comes down to something. A variety of different things. Then Pharaoh called Abraham and said, I added something here and I may be wrong. All this would take a little time. It takes some days, right? But they could, the Egyptians were smart enough to know that when she came in here, this struck and she's okay. She's just as well as the day she came in here. If I was doing a movie of it, I would have Lot ratting him out for, for, for gain. That's his wife. At least this Pharaoh had the norms and standards. He wasn't going to kill a man to get this woman. And so it's very embarrassing for a believer of Abraham's stature to be rebuked by a pagan unbeliever. And the pagan unbeliever is right. It can happen to us. Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this? What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that this was your wife? Did you know that Sarah was his half-sister? Apparently that Sarah had a, 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 a wife at one died had these boys and then another woman, and so this was her half-sister. But it's, the half-truth is still a lie. Why did you not say she's my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. <laughs> I have to raise my voice to kind of be the, the, the drama it would be if you were doing a, doing a thing with it. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Pharaoh just increased Abraham's wealth significantly, even though Abraham had failed. At least this Pharaoh, he didn't say, who, who is your God? And what, 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 what? No, he's not interested in that. But he's got, he's got the fear factor. There's something going on with this guy. This doesn't happen. Because these people, people were superstitious. People believed in deities. People believed in things. And they would think, why would everybody get sick but her? And here we are. And go back. Get out of here. So Abraham had his, had his STA deal. Left the land that he's supposed to stay in. God didn't say, now if there's a famine, you can leave. Because God has strings he can pull. He can take us right up to the edge and then deliver us. And we trust in him all the way up to the edge. That's the game plan. No matter what the threat is. You get God on your side, and no matter what the threat is, he's going to be there for you. So 
So uh, he goes back to the land, and that's where he, uh, he offers a rebound offering. That's what he does. And he cuts ties with Lot. But it all worked out perfectly because they had so much livestock as a result of this trip down there. It added to his whole deal. God can bless a person. It, it, but, but the thing is, you gotta, God knew, knew his heart of hearts and that he just got under his sin nature with regard to the beauty of Sarah and the fear of the famine. He, he wasn't gonna stay in Egypt forever. His idea was the famine wasn't in Egypt, so we'll go down there and write it out, and then we'll come back. Well, by, probably by the time they came back, uh, they started getting rain in Canaan again, and the famine was lifted, because that's what the famine was about, lack of rain. And so in this, in this connection, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we read the Hebrews passage, not knowing where he was going, just trusting in God to an alien land, a foreign land, dwelling in tents with his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Uh, there is a sign for this covenant. You know, the Noe covenants, the rainbow. The sign for the Abrahamic covenant is, it looks like it's adding insult to injury. In his old age, when he's sexually dead, he's 100 years old. This is when this miracle occurred. So they could have a child, Isaac. He tells them, you know what the sign of this covenant's gonna be? All the males in your organization, including you, will have your foreskin removed. What fun. On that occasion, Abraham did it just like that. And everybody was out of commission for about three days. So that's the sign of the Abrahamic covenant is down there in Genesis 17 that Abraham took Ishmael, his son. Ishmael, his son? Yeah, that was Operation Ishmael. Well, that, was, that was Sarah's idea. See, another failure. I, I, I have to point out their high points and their low points. But when, when the whole thing is evaluated, the high outweighs all the other. She made the suggestion that Abraham sleep with her maidservant, the Egyptian, Hagar. He did. And she gets pregnant like that. <clears throat> That's the background to Ishmael. Oh, you know what we call that here at church? Energy of the flesh. We got it. We got it. God expects us to make it happen. No, he doesn't. His word is on the line. His character's on the line. He's going to tell you what he's going to do. They weren't faith resting, not having a child. That's a big point in all of this. They weren't faith resting it. But they came to a point where they did faith rest it. The two of them. They finally had a relaxed mental attitude, RMA, and had peace. But up till then, it was, here's Ishmael. Ishmael is his son. There's a whole story about all of that. Hagar. You might feel sorry for her. She was used. No, she was blessed by association by being with him. She gave birth to Ishmael. And she was, and, and when she was pregnant, See, she serves, she serves Sarah. Sarah made life hard on her. And she brought it on herself, too. You know how people are? I don't want to just say women. It sounds like I'm sexist or something. But, but how STAs are, okay? 
She probably came in, you know, rubbed her stomach. Yeah. Here's Sarah over here. <laughs> this, is, this is the real world. And so Sarah just made her work day a lot worse. And finally, Sarah, Hagar did a runaway. She's going back to Egypt, pregnant as she can be on the road. God stops her and tells her to go back and submit to your mistress, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. That boy of yours, he's just going to be another guy. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to be a founder of a great nation. Ishmael had seven, I think six, it's six or seven sons all became princes. All of, all of them founded nations. That's why we have all these Arabs. <laughs> In history. Finally, they were evicted from the home. When Ishmael was 13, they were sent packing because Ishmael mocked baby Isaac on his wean. They had a party when, at an event when they would do the weaning of the child and Ishmael was poking fun at him and stuff. And Sarah didn't like that one little bit. She said, you get him and get her out of here. Well, Abraham loved him. He, he was, he's normal. He did. And God said to him, listen to your wife. On this one, she's right on point. Listen to her. So Abraham packed a bag, and they went down the road, and they wound up by a well, and they didn't have. They found out in a place where they didn't have water, and she she separated from uh, the 13-year-old. Said, "I can't watch him. I can't sit here and watch him die." And it was pointed out to her by the Lord. There's water right over there. Ishmael is going to be a warrior. The life, of, the life of hardship sometimes makes people stronger and better. All the soft living and everything, every little thing is provided. He, he grew up fast. And he says his hand was against every man. He was a warrior, went out and built, built all this stuff up. And now we have all these Arabs. All this, all this revolves around this. Uh, so Abraham took Ishmael his son and all who were in his house and all who were bought with money, every male among the men of Abraham's household and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day as God had said to him. Okay, gang, this is what we're doing. You live under my roof, so to speak. You're gonna be circumcised. And when your babies come on the scene, your boy babies come on the scene, they will be circumcised on the eighth day. Because if you do it earlier, it doesn't say it in the Bible. It's not medically sound, and they could bleed to death. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. He was born under the Abrahamic, and, the, and, and it was also incorporated into the mosaic. And then later on, after Isaac was born, then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. And then finally, his willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Now this is a killer. Isaac is, a, Isaac is up there in the like the 17 year old, or I, 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 don't quote me on that, but he's, 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 an, he's, he's practically an adult. And one day, Abraham's minding his own business and God says to take him out and sacrifice him. We might get onto that later. That really sounds bad to someone who isn't, isn't schooled at things. Because Abraham knew something. He knew even if I kill him, God will have to bring him back. Because he already told me, in Isaac, your seed will be called. Well, Isaac can't be dead and gone. So he takes him to this mountain and he doesn't tell Sarah. It isn't her test. He does it and doesn't miss a beat. By this time, he has grown to this statue. If God says it, I'm doing it. He's righteous and so forth. And he took his son and his son did all the heavy lifting, got the wood, uh, got, uh, uh, got the knife, sacrificial knife, put it on a donkey, and they went up to this mountain. 
Along the way, Isaac says, uh, we forgot something. What? We, we didn't bring a sacrifice. Abraham kept the, kept the news from him too, but he said the right thing. God will provide a sacrifice. And he bound the boy. There's no evidence. He said, what are you doing? There's nothing in there like that. It's, it's, it's it, you know, that part. And as he raised the knife to cut his throat, a voice came and stopped him in midair. He had all, Isaac was as good as dead to Abraham. He was just getting ready to pull the proverbial trigger. And he was stopped. And a big ram was tied up in the bushes over there, got his horns all tangled up into it. God provided the sacrifice. They sacrificed and went home. Look at this man. He passed this test in flying colors. And you can only imagine how dear Isaac was to him. More than just a normal son because of all the history. He knew that Isaac, if he was dead, would be resurrected. But he didn't have to do that. What does this illustrate, folks? It illustrates that God offered up his own uniquely begotten son. He had that same affection for Jesus, who, during his life, followed the, uh, the Father's plan without, without one misstep, or he couldn't have been qualified to be the Savior. This was his beloved son. He's asked, he, he, gave, he offered him up on the cross, and he didn't pull back at the last minute. He went through the whole ordeal, and Jesus has been given a name that is above every name. And this cosmos system is going to find this out. Everybody's going to find it out. Those on the good side that are believers, those that aren't, they're all going to find it out. They're going to find out this Bible is true all the way. All these people today that are discounting the land of promise, from the Palestinians to stick your nose in another one, America. We need two nations here. And we would like you to uh, kind of back off from your attacks right now. We'll get, uh, this, is, this is the Biden administration. This, this is people saying this stuff. Oh, you, 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 could, you, could, you could fight Hamas until January. <laughs> and the Jews, they're gonna fight them until they're gone. If they keep up what they're doing, they got the North secure. They're going after the South. No, they said, there's one person said, one, one American soldier that fought in Afghanistan, who's now, he's an Israeli, and he's over there now. He said, I don't know of any nation that have taken such pains to protect the enemy's civilian population as Israel has in this instant. Do you know one? Did the United States work hard at that? Concern themselves with all those Japanese at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? What if that happened today? Men, women, and children drop a couple of atomic bombs on them. Yeah. And Israel is down there doing this under Operation Iron Swords. And I told you Sunday, or I told you last time, I'm Sunday probably too, uh, keep praying for them, that God will bless the descendants of Abraham. Because these people who came into their homes and butchered these people, the UN and all the women's organizations, they have to have their arms twisted to speak out against it. And they got all these women's organizations from Planned Parenthood up the ladder. Planned Parenthood is just designed to keep more young girls coming in the world and boys. Abortion on demand. It used to be called eugenics. There should be no place for this. These other organizations as well. They'll scream and yell, but these are Jewish women. Those who curse Abraham. 
will be cursed. And so who in the hell do we think we are over there telling them what they ought to do? And so you can't deal with the United States because we, we like the, the old American Indian did, white man speaks with forked tongue. <laughs> you bet. They'll, they'll say one thing one day and the next day something else. I got a verse. The treacherous one. The duplicit one. The destroyer. Keeps on destroying. I notice there's a lot in the news today about worldwide nuclear war and how unthinkable it is. But Christ controls history. This descendant of Abraham in whom all nations will be blessed wherever there's positive volition. But he controls the outcome of things and events and yet yeah, there'll be a nuclear war. And there'll be a victim. It'll be unprecedented. I wonder how many of these fundamentalists know that. It's not, not hard to figure out. Thank you, Father, this time we've had together. Refresh us and make, encourage us to be uh, like Abraham. In Jesus' name, amen.